good evening. My name is Vince Houghton. I'm the historian and curator at the International Spy Museum, and I'd like to welcome you to our program tonight, which should be an absolutely fascinating program. Uh, this is something that, uh, if you've seen a Law and Order episode at any one point in the last 25 years, the whole ripped from the headlines <laughs> idea. Uh, every day you see in the news the story of the idea about recruiting Westerners to go fight overseas for jihadist organizations, for ISIS, for other things. And the question always comes up, what is the motivation? Why are they doing this? What, what is behind these ideas? And so we're going to get a little bit of that tonight, and we're going to get a much more interesting, fascinating story, a story that a lot of people don't know about. Uh, and it, it, particularly because we're somewhat ignorant Americans, you know, anything north of the border we don't pay a lot of attention to. But the possibility of a terrorist attack in Toronto of the level that may have even come close to the real cultural impact, at least, of a 9-11 uh, is a story that, that because it didn't happen, and we'll talk about one of the big reasons why tonight, uh, a lot of people don't know about this. So you're not here to hear me talk, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Speckard. She is the uh, a adjunct associate professor of psychiatry at Georgetown University Medical School. Uh, she's been working in the field of PTSD since the 1980s. Uh, that's something actually near and dear to my heart and has an extensive experience working in Europe, the Middle East, and the former Soviet Union. Uh, she's the chair of many organizations that have many really, really, really long names, but I'm gonna say them anyway. She was the chair of the NATO Human Factors and Medicine Research and Technology Experts Group on the Social, Cultural, and Organizational Aspects of Terrorism. She also served as a co-chair of the NATO Russia Human Factors and Medicine Research Task Group on Social Scientist Support to Military Personnel Engaged in Counterinsurgency and Counterterrorism Operations and served on the NATO Human Factors and Medic Medicine Research Task Group Moral Dilemmas and Military Mental Health Outcomes. Got it. She is a member of the United Nations roster of experts for the Terrorism Prevention Branch Office on Drugs and Crime, and was previously awarded a Public Health Service Fellowship at the United States Department of Health and Human Services, where she served as a research fellow. She's provided expert consultation all over the world for both the DOD and as well as European governments for programs for prevention and rehabilitation of individuals committed to political violence and militant jihad. In 2006 and 2007, she worked with the U.S. Department of Defense to design and pilot test the detainee rehabilitation program in Iraq. In 2002, she interviewed hostages taken in the Moscow Dubrova Theater about their psychological responses and observations of the suicidal terrorists, and did the same in 2005 with the surviving hostages from the Beslan school takeover. Since 2002, she's conducted more than 400 research interviews of family members, friends, close associates, and hostages of terrorists and militant jihadi extremists all over the world, Palestine, Israel, Iraq, Lebanon, Morocco, Russia, Chechnya, Belarus, Netherlands, United Kingdom, Belgium, and France. If that wasn't enough, she is also the director of the Holocaust Survivors Oral History Project in Belarus, a project constructing the history of the Minsk ghetto and Holocaust in Belarus through oral histories and archival research. She also worked with survivors of the Chernobyl disaster and has written about stress responses to toxic disasters. She worked with American expatriates after 9-11 and conducted research on acute stress responses to terrorism in this population. She also studies, well, do you have time to do any of this stuff? She also <laughs> studies psychological resilience to terrorism in various populations, including American civilians, military, and diplomats serving in Iraq under high threat security conditions. If that wasn't enough, she's written books. She's the author of the books Talking to Terrorists, Fetal Abduction, Timothy Tottle's Amazing Dream, that sounds a little lighter than the other ones, and co-author of Undercover Jihadi and Warrior Princess. And that's why you're not going to hear a lot from me tonight, because if you did, it would take another 20 minutes. So let me please uh, welcome uh, Dr. Annie Specker. Thank you. So, tonight we're here to talk about Undercover Jihadi, and thank you for that great introduction. And uh, the Toronto 18. These were a motley group of young men and women who played support roles, and they were off their tracks. They became homegrown terrorists, but they were, started out as disillusioned young men, and they were craving meaning and glory in their lives. I should say, uh, Vince you know, read this great big long list, but I'm a research psychologist, and I did clinical for years. So, you know, getting into people's heads is what I do. And uh, they were frustrated by their own lives 
and they were frustrated by geopolitics. And they took, over time, all that frustration and all that anger, and they channeled it into um, anger over the troops, the Canadian troops being in Afghanistan. They were taken in by the then Al-Qaeda meme of Islam, uh, Islamic lands, and Islamic people are under attack. And that meme has now been overtaken by ISIS and uh, used by ISIS as well. So here we have Fahim Ahmad. He's an unemployed young man, starts out in high school, and um, Mubin's going to tell you more in depth about him. He's married with a baby. He's, oops, sorry about that. Let's see. He's uh, connected over the internet, and nowadays you see how easily we connect with each other you know, around the world. It's not hard anymore. And he's connected over the internet with a young man named Abid Khan, who's a Pakistani UK national. And Abid Khan has the idea of creating this international terrorist network. And he at least uh, proclaims that he can get access to the Al Qaeda training camps and that he can get people in. But he needs these others that are bragging on the internet about being jihadis to be serious and to be willing to go to the training camps. And he claims that he'll facil facilitate it. So Fahim uh, gets really serious when he realizes, oh, I can really do this. I'm not just going to be a talker. So in December 2005, he organizes a military-style winter training camp to select recruits. He invites all his friends. And he holds a second camp the following spring. Uh, you'll see more about that camp with Mubin as well. He also scouted for a safe house in northern Ontario. And he had two um, US operatives in what uh, eventually became known by law enforcement as the Toronto 18. And the two Americans were in Atlanta. And they um, looked around Washington, DC. I don't know if they uh, looked at the spy museum, but they looked at quite a few places with the idea of, uh, we'll try to blow them up. And their idea was, after they did their crimes here, they would run up to Canada and hide out in the safe house. And it was way far north, in the snowy north. And they hoped that they wouldn't be discovered there. Fahim also uh, arranged for his cadres to bring in uh, guns from the US. They smuggled them in. One of them was uh, taped to the crotch of one of the guys that was the smugglers. They got caught. They ended up in prison. But Fahim dream dreamed big. He wanted to storm Parliament Hill in Ottawa. He wanted to take the politicians there hostage. And he wanted to behead them one by one. And he wanted to sit in the main chair of the prime minister, and go on television, and say, until you take the troops out of Afghanistan, I'm going to keep chopping heads. So he's a pretty scary guy. He got caught because of Mubin's efforts. He pleaded guilty in May 2010. He was sentenced to 16 years in prison. And he was recently denied early release. Here we have Zachariah Amara. This is one of his friends. And uh, they were the two main leaders of two groups that splintered at one point. And Zachariah participated in the winter training camp. Um, he made a video of everything they did. And you'll see that video in Mubin's presentation. And he sent that video overseas to the Mujahideen in Pakistan to convince them that they were indeed serious and that they wanted some of their guys to be admitted into Al Qaeda training. And they wanted help. They wanted funds. They wanted weapons. They wanted to carry out their ideas. They wanted to become big and glorious in their minds. And he thought it was pathetic that Fahim had only a few handguns to show for his efforts. So he decided to go on his own. He splintered off from Fahim. And he pushed ahead with a plot to blow up buildings in downtown Toronto. He had three buildings in his sights, all of them with symbolic meanings. And he planned to uh, fill up uh, trucks with fertilizer. And he developed a detonator. And if he had been successful, we would have seen three bombings like what was done for the uh, Murray Federal Building in Oklahoma City. It would have been the same kind of explosion, devastating. It would have been Canada's 9-11. Uh, Zachariah was also caught because of Mubian. And uh, he pleaded guilty in 2009. And he was sentenced in January 2010 to life in prison. Here you see a few of the others. Jamal James over on the side. Uh, Jamal uh, went to Pakistan. He didn't get into an Al Qaeda training camp. He got sick. But uh, he had full intent to do so. 
and some of the others. So I'm not going to take too much time. And all of these guys were following uh, Anwar al-Awlaki. And al is someone that uh, we droned, I believe, in 2011. Uh, we killed him, but he's still alive. He lives on the internet, and he inspires from beyond the grave. al popularized the idea of uh, endless jihad, and he uh, used someone else's lecture, a scholar's lecture. It's called Constance on the Path to Jihad. And in English, he taught that every Muslim has a duty to um, join jihad, to take hijra, to go to places like Syria and Iraq, Chechnya, Kashmir, wherever Muslims are fighting jihad, to go there and to join. And that they had the duty to, to fight jihad to the very end, to the end times. And he's an extremely convincing man. He's very charming. He's from a fine family. He uh, spent some of his years uh, working here as an adult. He spent some of his uh, childhood years growing up here in the US. And so he speaks English perfectly, and he can uh, convince like nothing else. He's got this uh, authority and charm that comes with probably his status uh, from his family. And uh, he's just knowledgeable enough to be extremely dangerous. So we see all these plots, the Toronto 18, that we're feeding from his hand. Uh, Rasha Shana Chaudhry, who is uh, the girl in the middle here. See her just, uh, just cut off a bit. Rasha Shana is one of the scariest ones. She was a number one student at King's College in London. And she was uh, due to graduate that year. And she downloaded one of al -Waki's, um lectures. And she was completely fascinated by him. So then she downloaded the whole set. And she listened week after week after week after week and fed from the hand of Anwar al-Laki. She got completely crazy. And this girl that was on the road to success, the number one in her college class at King's College. King's College is like Georgetown. It's a very good university. And um, uh, instead of completing her studies, she dropped out. She bought two knives. She found the parliamentarian that she believed um, well, she found one parliamentarian among many that had voted for the um, war in Iraq. And she went uh, to his office and stabbed him. She didn't manage to kill him. He lived. But she's, uh, of course, in prison. We also have the underwear bomber up in the corner that uh, was uh, studying under al Laki. And most of these over the internet, a few of them met him in person. We have Nidal Hassan. A uh, US military psychiatrist who uh, was in uh, touch with al Laki, asking him, if I don't agree with the war in Afghanistan, should I you know, do some kind of an attack? And he ended up doing an um, active shooter attack. So almost all the plots that we have seen in recent years, if they're English speaking, they've been uh, on the internet listening to al Laki and convinced by him that idea ideologically it's correct. And I should say, from my 400 interviews studying terrorists, what I found is that there's four things that make a terrorist. There's a group that's willing to use terrorism. There's an ideology that wrongly, it's always wrong, justifies that for this cause it's justified to use terrorism to attack civilians. It's always wrong, but they manage to argue ideologically that it's correct. So group, it's ideology. Third, some level of social support, which nowadays, you don't need a group in your town like these uh, Toronto 18 guys. Uh, you can find your social support on the internet. Sarnayev did that. And the fourth thing is your own individual vulnerabilities. If you're off your tracks in your life, as these young men were, then all of this can appeal to you. You, you can be angry about the things in your life that aren't going right, a bit angry about foreign policy, and it can be all channeled into that. And al is a master at that. So we know homegrown terrorism is alive and, in fact, growing. We found that. Um, Al-Qaeda came out with uh, Inspire magazine, which is an online uh, terrorist magazine. Uh, the Sarnayev brothers studied it and made their homemade pressure cooker bomb from it. You see this uh, open source jihad, the um, make, a, make a bomb in the kitchen of your mom. It's not a joke. It's for real. And that's the recipe they were following. And now we have ISIS with their online journal, Dabiq. And all of them encourage ideologically why you should do this. Um, misquote Islam and try to convince why you should be part of this. And um, 
then show all the grievances and only the grievances, not the whole story, and uh, play upon vulnerabilities. So for instance, one ISIS YouTube video has a doctor from the UK, it just kind of blows my mind, this young man that was a doctor, and he's sitting in that camp saying, um, I was depressed in the UK, and if you come here and you join Jihad, Jihad is the cure for depression. And this is a doctor talking, you know, it's like, oh, geez. So um, this is all out there on the internet these days, and uh, instructions and ideology. And we know that with the conflicts in Syria and Iraq, we, they've drawn an estimated 15,000 foreign fighters from 80 nations. And according to Peter Newman in uh, London at King's College, 20 to 25% of these foreign fighters are from Western countries, from Canada, from the US, from Europe. And 80% uh, of them are uh, part of ISIS. So ISIS isn't selective. They say, come all, come and join us, we'll train you. And they're uh, flying to Turkey and making their way in. And we don't know who is going. Maybe they went through Europe, pretended they were going on a European vacation. Maybe they went through some other way. We don't know who's all going. So when they come back, we don't always know that they're back. And this is a really huge problem. And if they come back and we know, do we arrest them and put them in prison? And if we put them in prison, do we run a de-radicalization program for them? And how about here in the US when we have this huge overcrowding problem um, in our prisons and way too many people in prisons? Do we suddenly start favoring terrorists and say we're going to de-radicalize you, but the guy that smoked a joint on parole, you know, he can rot in prison. How, how are we going to be fair about that? How are we going to do it? But if we don't do a de-radicalization program, are they going to seed themselves in our prisons? So I've got some really big questions to answer. And then, of course, the most important question is how can you prevent it to begin with? But uh, these foreign fighters are a problem for every country. And then we have uh, the ISIS meme, the spread of bad ideas. And Mubin's going to talk a lot more about this. But um, the ISIS meme grew out of the Al-Qaeda um, ideology, and that they've taken it even further. And memes are basically self-replicating units that mutate they respond to selective pressures, they change over time, they can compete, be inherited, and most importantly, they can be completely detrimental to their host. So you can take it on and it can destroy you. And we've seen this happen. And we've seen it go viral over the internet. So now we have things like, things that kids loved, Grand Theft Auto, Call of Duty. We see that they pick um, pieces of that and play with it and say, this is the real thing. You're playing a video game, you wanna come and play with us? You wanna be real? You wanna be a real man? Come and, come and join us. And then the thing that's um, perhaps even more chilling than the foreign fighters is the stay and act in place. This is um, uh, Al-Qaeda in uh, recent years, not in the beginning, and now ISIS from the beginning, encouraging simple but lethal homegrown attacks. So now we can take someone who's disillusioned, marginalized, frustrated, discriminated against, longing for belonging, identity, meaning, adventure. Does this sound like a teenager to you? It's a teenager, right? Uh, recognition, wanting to bolster their sense of manhood or womanhood, and also the mentally ill. We can take them and we can convince them with this ISIS meme and put them on a trajectory of terrorism of saying, just take your car and run over as many people as you can. Or go get a weapon and shoot as many as people as you can. Don't worry, if, if you get martyred, you go straight to paradise and you're a hero. You're one of us. And that's what we're seeing more and more. When, um, I think I'm not gonna say, it. well, for the Toronto 18, as I told you, they plan to blow up three buildings around Toronto. They also plan to storm their parliament. When we put our book out last October, Mobin and I were completely amazed. We called each other up and said, what the, and I don't wanna say it here because we're videoing, but, um, and the reason we said that was the day we released our book, somebody went, and we did not pay this guy, he went to the parliament and shot up the parliament, just like the Toronto 18 had planned to do.
So these ideas circulate and they come around again and again and again. And someone actually carried it out. We were completely amazed. We didn't know what to think. And um, these guys were deadly serious. Thank God that there was a person like Mubin from the Muslim community who stood up and stopped them and risked his own life doing it and really risked the life of his family too. He's got five kids, he's got parents, he's got a wife. And you know, if it was discovered that he was undercover doing that, you know, what could have happened? He could have come and killed them all, right? Still could. So I'm gonna stop there and um, introduce Mubin. And uh, in my view, Mubin deserves a medal. And uh, he's a hero. And I'm very, very proud to know him. I'm proud to be co-author on his book. And he's got a story to tell that's quite amazing. And we should really thank him because, you know, in all of our countries, we do a lot of Muslim bashing. But we need to thank those people that stand up and say, no, terrorism is not us. That's not who we are. And I'm willing to stand up against it to the extent that he went undercover and uh, stopped it himself. So, and that's uh, me. Thank you. I totally paid her to say all that about me. Ah, uh, wow. All uh, right, well, first of all, thank you very much for having me here. This is a, it's a most fitting place to be giving this talk. Um, when I was walking through yesterday, we, had, we did the tour, <clears throat> and in the, uh, I don't know if you've done the tour, I, I encourage you to do the tour. Uh, there's a section where you have to get your false identity, and uh, they, they did say that somebody was gonna question you on it, and I was totally ready for that. Um, uh, but they didn't, they didn't show up, so. I was walking around dressed in my jacket and people were like looking at me like, wait a second, is this guy gonna ask me? Is this guy gonna ask me? So, um, so very good to be here. I always like to be in DC. Um, uh, yeah, I'm gonna tell you the story about the Toronto 18, but what I'm gonna do is uh, my presentation is sectioned into two parts. One is my story, the Toronto 18, and then I'm gonna give you a, a, basically a briefing on the Syria foreign fighters. and. We hear a lot about ISIS on social media, uh, how they use social media. I'm gonna show you exactly how they do that. Um, <clears throat> after the case was done in 2010, and I'll give the chronology of things, uh, I got onto Twitter and uh, I watched the whole uh, foreign fighter phenomenon begin. Um, I saw, well, especially when the Syrian war began uh, about four years ago, uh, I got onto Twitter and started to see a lot of these Westerners who were calling people to go to fight in Syria, and individuals who had ended up, um, you know, reaching Syria and became fighters, and then bragging about their exploits and posting pictures of what they were doing there, and uh, it was a completely new thing that most people hadn't seen. You know, we have this idea that, you know, when we saw pictures of Bin Laden or or Ayman al Dawahiri, you know, they were in caves, right? And uh, you know, there was there's this caricature that the terrorist is this maniac, you know, who's living in a cave, and that's, that's not the case. Uh, we, we need to get away from these caricatures. Uh, you know, they, you know, nowadays, especially these young people, they're born and bred in this environment. So when we see their videos, we were like, wow, you know, they're so sophisticated. It's like, yeah, well, I mean, they're products of the system that, that we ourselves uh, are our product of. So uh, we shouldn't be too surprised at that. So, <clears throat> of course, you've seen the cover. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a, uh, a linear progressive model from normal, quote unquote, to violent extremist. And, and just three terms for you. Radicalization is a process whereby an individual comes to accept that violence is the way to go, is the way to affect political change. And once you come to believe that, you are an extremist. And when you act on that, you are a violent extremist, also known as terrorist. Okay? So, <clears throat> there's, this, uh, there's a huge debate in psychology, um, in nature versus nurture, right? How much of each plays a role in our development and, and identity construction. And so, you know, I, I leave it at uh, your personality and cognitive framing. It's just fancy terms for the way you think, the way you see the world around you. And a number of things might pop out for you. 
Uh, geopolitics could be you're born in a conflict environment. You're forced to think about geopolitics. Uh, deprivation and frustration. So you're deprived. You're frustrated at this, at this state of deprivation. You usually find who's responsible for this, this situation that I'm in. Uh, conflicts over meaning and identity. This is something that's a natural human psychological process. Adventure and money. Sometimes uh, people do it for money. And most people, and, and I should say that this is really where the overwhelming majority of, of radicalization ends. Uh, the vast majority of people who are radicalized do not become terrorists. They either get disillusioned, get bored, mature, um, or maybe in very rare cases continue being radicalized right to the end, but just never commit the violence. And when I put here individual and group dynamics, I'm talking about you know, an individual, how an individual may apply themselves into rectifying a situation that they think needs to be fixed, or uh, group dynamics. So when you are a part of a group, chances are you're gonna do things that you won't do as an individual. Remember when you were 15, 16, and you were hanging out with your buddies? Yeah, so it's no different. The, there's a whole psychological discourse on group dynamics, how you become a polarization, group pol polarization, all sorts of things that, that come with this. But there are some things that stand out when it comes to violent extremists. So making your own propaganda is an indicator that a person's probably gonna do something. Or intensity of exclusivity. So if they're a very closed circle of people, uh, they're conducting intelligence, information gathering, um, site selection, site targeting, or counterintelligence to see if anyone's following me. These are indicators that this person's up to no good. Contact with known extremists. So you are the company you keep, right? And uh, overseas travel or online, right? I mean, the Sarnavs, again, they, they found this stuff all online. And finally, recruiting others, because the more you talk about it, the more you internalize these ideas. So I'm gonna put myself into this, into this system here and to show you where I fit into this. And these stars are, are wild card factors. So these are just like a, something that takes a person from A right to C. So a drone bombed their family. They, they have no religious education, no ideology, but they know that you bombed their family. They become a terrorist. Or an individual who might get involved with group action but doesn't do it for them. You know, they're not looking for that. They, they want things to move fast. They realize that, well, this peaceful system is not enough. Change takes too long. Um, forget it, I'm just gonna go straight to C. So here's me growing up in, when I was very young, I uh, went to Quran school. And Quran school in this context was an Indo-Pakistani type environment. And there, you learn the Quran, but you only know how to recite it. You don't learn what it means. You don't study Arabic. So you can read it, but you don't know what it's saying. Number two, the boys and girls are separate. So you, there's no gender mixing. Number three, if you make a mistake, you're gonna get slapped. Like you see the pictures here. You get slapped, you get beaten, you'll, put in, you'll be put into stress positions, what we call stress positions, okay? And by daytime, I'm going to public school. That's me in the front center there with the flared collar. You like that? <laughs> yeah. Um, and in the daytime, look at the environment. Gender mixing, very liberal environment. If you made a mistake, you wouldn't get slapped. The teachers aren't mean, right? So what this does is it creates, I think, an identity crisis just waiting to happen because you're, you're wondering, well, am I supposed to be like this or am I supposed to be like that? I, I don't understand. This is me in high school. Now, if you see that symbol up there, I'm right next to that. I don't know why I'm looking down and looking sad, but maybe it was a few beers I had if possible. Uh, I wasn't picked on in high school. I wasn't bullied. I mean, we were the cool kids. The, girl, the cheerleaders were our girlfriends. The, the jocks hated us. Uh, we really were the cool kids. And what happened one day was my parents had left the country. And so, of course, I took the opportunity to announce to everyone that there was going to be a party at my house. And uh, everyone came, and uh, it, was, it was a great party, man. Um, you know, yeah, beer, girls, smoking joints in the corner. It was awesome. But unbeknownst to me, my father had told my, his, his brother, my uncle, to check on the house while he was gone. So in the middle of the party, my uncle walks in, and all hell broke loose. Of course, everyone ran out of the house, and, uh, and, and for me, it was the end of the world because I was gonna be in a lot of trouble. I knew that. 
And so they, my uncle called up the other uncles and they sat me down in the middle of the room and they made me feel so bad about what I had done that I realized the only way for me to, to, to salvage my reputation in the community with my family was to quote unquote, get religious. So what happened was, oh, this is in the army cadets, this is my family now. Uh, my kids are also in the army cadets, social engineering, go big or go home, right? Um, and, and basically what I say here is, and why I, I highlight these things is that these are peer groupings that, that I have. And with those peer groupings come different values. And all these values are, are swirling around in my head and I'm supposed to make sense of all this. So of course I go with this, okay, so if you see on the, this category, remember the first category of things that pop out in people's minds? Well, this is, I can start to see this is what's happening to me. And for me, I, to express myself, I joined this uh, Muslim group. It's an apolitical group. Uh, they don't talk about politics. But what they do is when you, you go to the Muslim countries and you talk to other Muslims and you say the way to bring about change in the world is to, to pray, to fast, you know, to, to be more religious. And so as I was walking around the area in Pakistan, I came upon these individuals, these guys, who beards, turbans, and guns, lots of guns, rocket propelled grenades, machine guns, machine gun, you know, uh, weapon, uh, weapon belts, all, uh, ammunition belts. And I came up to them and I told them the same thing. I said, this is how you bring about change in the world. And so they said to me, well, if you want to bring about change in the world, you do it with this. And he held up his AK-47. So I thought, all right, pretty cool. So I come back in 2005, uh, 1995, and a group called the Taliban have come to power in Afghanistan. And I realized I met these guys. They did what they said they were going to do. These people must be right. And I became a supporter of the Taliban, 100%. And in 1998, when Osama bin Laden came out with his fatwa, jihad against the world, I became a supporter of Osama bin Laden. And from 95 to 2001, I ran with extremist groups, or I guess you could say we were a, a network of individuals, not a, a hardcore group per se, but you know, we knew people there, we knew people over there, three guys that I knew, two went to Pakistan, one went to Yemen, never saw them again. And I was always on the verge of going. I, I had in, invitations to go Pakistan, go to Yemen, go to Chechnya, wherever I wanted to go. And obviously, I mean, I started to dress like this, and I did this until like my early 30s. It was only until you know, the trials uh, that I got involved with, the, with the Toronto 18, that I realized, you know, um, I need to come back down to earth. All right, so, so you can see that in the last group, uh, the last category of indicators, I'm, the, I'm showing three out of five. Okay, this is a person that's right on the verge. So the 9-11 attacks happen, and I'm on my way to work, and I hear that plane has hit the building. And the first thing out of my mouth is, Allahu Akbar, God is great. I don't even know why I did it. And as the day went on, I went home for lunch. My wife is watching the TV, all stressed out. My Muslim friends are, my Muslim friends are calling me saying, good Muslim friends. Mubin, this is not our religion. This is not what we're about. My non-Muslim friends are calling me saying, Mubin, is this your religion? Is this what you're about? <laughs> and so I was inundated from all sides, which forced me to reevaluate my commitment to this cause. Because I could understand the idea of fighting combatants, but the idea of flying a plane into a building with innocent people, I mean, these are not combatants. I mean, how did that fit into, I just couldn't understand it. So I realized I needed to study my religion. In early 2002, in February, March, I went to Syria. And in Syria, I, I put theological reframing. I don't know why that quote is backwards, I gotta fix that. Uh, these little things, they, they really, uh, theological reframing is just fancy for, I used to believe this, but then I came to believe this, and why? Because I spent a year and a half with an Islamic scholar who debunked my interpretations. who went through each verse that these extremists use and said, no, I mean, you're, for example, chapter 9, verse 5, you know, kill them where you, uh, where, kill them where you find them. That's, the, that's actually half of the verse. And, and so he said, and when I said to him, I was like, yeah, but the Quran says this. He says, oh, he says, do you, do you normally start reading from verse 5? You know, go to verse 1, and then 2, and then 3. So when you read verse 1, it talks about a treaty with the polytheists, with the pagans of Mecca, uh, that the Muslims had 
uh, contracted, but they broke the treaty. And verse 4 and verse 12 make it very clear that this does not apply to those people who, with whom you do have a treaty and do not persecute you, do not evict you from your homes because you believe in one God. So it was a very specific thing is that basically it's saying, look, these people who broke the peace treaty, you fight them, right? That's, I mean, that's what we say today. If we have a treaty with a country and yet they break the treaty or they violate the ceasefire, well, then hostilities will resume, right? Uh, when I talk about uh, dogmatic idealism versus pragmatic realism, that's just fancy for, um, you know, what I think, the theory, as opposed to the reality. The theory of the sky and the reality on the ground. Police state, Syria was a real police state. I know in the West we use this term police state like haphazardly. Don't do that. It, I mean, you really got to go and see. Well, don't go and see. Uh, take the word of people who have gone there to see what a real police state is like. Okay? And Syria was that. And really, I came to acknowledge and, 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 and uh, appreciate the rights that Muslims have in the West. You know, people can say it's Darul Kufar, you know, it's the land of disbelief, or they make up all these ideas and all these stories about how bad it is. Well, you're not being tortured, right? You're a Muslim in this, you have freedom to do what you want, you really do. Religious freedom, stand on the corner and rail against the government all you want, nobody's going to disappear you. So these were the things, the reality that hit me. And so I had enough, I came back to Canada in 2005, 2004. I, the first week I come back to Canada, I see this guy's picture in the, in the newspaper. Momin Kawaja has been arrested in conjunction with the London fertilizer bomb plot. Momin Kawaja sat right next to me in Quran school. He was my buddy. We used to play with toy cars, used to go upstairs, and he had been arrested on terrorism charges. I actually contacted the Security Intelligence Service to give a character reference for the family, to say, no, this is a good family. And the family is a good family, but you know, one of them, I guess, went sideways. So the Canadian Security Intelligence Service, of course, an hour after my phone call, said, uh, somebody's going to come talk to you, if you don't mind. And uh, sure enough, I, be I was recruited uh, by the intelligence service to be an undercover operative. I mean, it was very simple for me. After these experiences that I had, I felt, yeah, you know what? I don't like what these people are doing. Uh, it is my religious duty to stop them. And, um, and so I did that. For a year and a half, I conducted numerous infiltration operations, uh, many of which will never be known, uh, ever, uh, except for one case in 2005, which moved on to a criminal prosecution. So the way in Canada it works is uh, the uh, security intelligence is done by the uh, CSIS, and the uh, criminal intelligence is done by the police. In the U.S., the FBI does both. So I traversed over to the RCMP, and this is how I became known, because it was a public prosecution. So now let's look at some of these guys that, that, that get caught up in this. So we heard a little bit about Fahim. I mean, 1984, the Soviets have invaded. Uh, he's forced to flee with his family. Grows up in a refugee camp, right? Look at, remember that, that linear progressive pathway? You can see now why somebody like this will get caught up in that, right? Uh, he, he family arrives in 1994 and settles in an area just outside of the main city. We heard a little bit about Zakaria Mara. Look, non-practicing Muslim father, relatively practicing Christian mother. Father's got a job with an oil company, he's never home. And when his, finally, when his parents finally divorced, he told me his dad just threw him the car keys and that was it. Never saw him again. Yeah, gangster culture. Because before they were quoting Osama bin Laden, they were quoting 50 Cent. Because the idea of the gangster culture is this. It's the violence and the criminality. It's the yo, yo, yo. It's the you got to be rough and tough. You have to depict this image of you're rough and tough and you're willing to use violence. It's very easy for people who internalize these, these values to become violent extremists. I'm not saying that rap makes terrorists. I'm saying that the mentality that goes with it, when you internalize these values, it is much easier for you to become a violent extremist. So what happens is they're in high school and they start this religious group called the, the Brothers of Meadowvale. Okay, and I start to look at what else is happening in their environment. So they're at school, they're talking about this stuff. Now they go to this Islamic center, they meet a like-minded individual, Abdul Qayyum Jamal, they start talking about this stuff. Abdul Qayyum Jamal was an, a, a loser. The community didn't want anything to do with him, he was always going on and on and on about government this, government that. 
but these people were all about that as well. And so they met. And so a blob forms, okay? And this is just really the dynamics of how people and places interact with each other and certain types of places. So, you know, I always make this joke. Uh, it's not that the authorities spy on mosques. That's ridiculous. Uh, if you are investigating bikers, you're going to probably end up at a bar or a strip joint. And if you're investigating white supremacists, yeah, you'll probably end up at a bar and a strip joint. Uh, the point is, is that these are the places of socialization. Um, so the idea that, I mean, it's not about spying on mosques. It's about spying on people who go to mosques and then collaborate in the mosques, using the mosque, defiling the mosque, really, for their activities in, you know, in advancement of their objectives. And so what happens is, Fahim, we heard he got married, so his, his parents kicked him out of his house. His parents were not that religious. Uh, the wife, the, the family of the wife said, okay, you can come and live at our house, but you gotta go to school. But of course, the wife's younger brother was going to this school, and so who else was going to that school? Well, I mean, Durrani, this is him at 16, all right? And he was known to be lecturing the boys about how, Muslim boys, about how they shouldn't be talking to girls, and, and telling the girls, who he shouldn't have been talking to, not to talk to the boys. So another blob forms, because he is now going to this Islamic center. We see again, well, who else is going to this Islamic center? Look at, ja, look at the name, Jamal, because he comes from the background, what? Rastafarian background. So the deity, Ja, Rastafari, right? Deity is Ja. Now the, the Arabic word Jamal, it's an Arabic word, Arabic name. So look at how he brings the two identities together in a newfound identity. So of course the second blob forms, people and places. Now these are not the only blobs because now you have the internet. So this blob three is Abid Khan and two of his cohorts. And Abid Khan is from the UK. And we heard of course these two from Atlanta, Georgia. And they're all conspiring online. And they're talking about how they need to do something. So we, you heard about uh, the two guys who came from Atlanta. Well, here is their surveillance video they took of sites in D.C. You're going to hear him say, hold on, let me focus on it. And he's doing it basically, you want to take a picture of something behind you, tradecraft. You're going to take a picture of me, but you're really taking the picture of that behind you. Okay, you got some uh, oil refineries. I think, what are they called, refineries? No. All right, check, looking at the police checkpoint from far away, and then you'll see the next clip, it'll be a little closer. Now they're really paranoid. What are the chances of that driving by? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Department of Energy, it's a critical infrastructure target. That's a cultural target. Now it's closer to the checkpoint. It's to see who is where, what kind of security procedures are in place. They were really, really paranoid, thinking that people were following them, and they were. So that's the end of that. So now what happens is enough talk, time for action. Abid Khan gets onto a plane gets, and comes to Toronto. Uh, these two from Atlanta get on a Greyhound bus, come up to Toronto. And now watch how quickly things accelerate. So for five years, they're just talking. They're, they're going through their period of radicalization, the process by which they come to take on extreme views or by which to take on, uh, they come to take on the view that violence is acceptable. Khan goes to Pakistan. Fahim Ahmed orders guns to be brought across the border. And like we heard, they had bullets in their socks, in their shoes. They had guns taped to them all over the place. They got busted hard. Uh, Sadiqi goes to Bangladesh. Haris Ahmed goes to Pakistan, hooks up with Abid Khan. Fahim, uh, uh, Jamal James goes to Pakistan also. Uh, did not actually obtain any training because the places that he tried to go to were bombed. And uh, Fahim, in conjunction with Durrani, set up a training camp in, uh, you know, north of the city. 
And basically the idea is they want to train these guys to a, a basic level of competency. But these guys that are sent over, they're going to get more sophisticated advanced training, come back, train the rest of us, and then we can go and commit our attacks. So this is just a, what's called a link analysis chart. Um, but you can see how it tentacles out. So for example, top right, Yunus Suli. <clears throat> uh, he hit some doors on the way out. I, I don't know what happened. Um, he was the son of a Moroccan diplomat. When they raided his, uh, his room, he was literally in the process of building a website teaching kids how to make a suicide vest. And he had more data on him, electronic data, than Osama bin Laden. Okay. So in these five years, this is what I say, regular involved visits to jihadi sites that give you justification for terrorism, plus frequently viewing jihadi videos which desensitize you, um, which make it, you know, which... I mean, I, I'm completely desensitized to beheading videos. I've seen, I don't even know how many. I mean, since 2003, I think it was. I mean, hundreds. Uh, plus the perceived self-duty that I have to do something. This is a person that is severely at risk for recruitment by violence extremists, okay? So the plan is simple. Three one-ton ammonium nitrate truck bombs, all right? And that bottom left-hand corner is the Murrah building in Oklahoma City, right? Um, and the idea was, and they talked about how maybe we should do it at rush hour because in the, in the area that the first bomb was supposed to go off, it's a high pedestrian traffic area. And they said, you know, should we put metal chips in it, ball bearings, because we want to kill as many people as possible. Right? These are the kinds of things that they thought up. So here's a video that they made of the training camp. And the point of this, and now all of the, the yelling and all that is all superimposed onto it. It's edited, of course. And the idea was to, to show the, the Mujahideen that, look, we have guys that they've, 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 they've committed or they've obtained some level of training. Um, so send guys, send backup, send expertise. That's a tent there in white. So the idea is, look, we are coming onto your lands and we're going we're gonna to plant our flag. Those are paintball guns they have. That guy on the right, former army reservist with actual military training. Of course, we did firearms training, so I had to train them, but at the same time, not give them enough skills, you know, to commit attacks. I had to teach them the safe handling of a firearm, uh, because the last thing I wanted was one of these guys to shoot themselves in the back or something, and then it would have been, you know, look, the government sent in an agent to shoot your kids, right? All right, so I'm just going to, I mean, you get an idea of it, right? So... Zakari Amara decides, first what he does is he registers in a, in a college course and he learns how to make a circuit so that he can make his bomb detonator. And so here's his own cell phone video that he made of his video. Now look at the top of the screen. When you, when you look, when you see it, I know it's a little bouncy, but you're going to see a kid's car seat and a kid's toy, right and left respectively. Okay, he's just showing you where the, the two cables meet. When that sparks, that shows you that the circuit is active and that it works. So if you look at the top, see the car seat? See the kid's toy? He's doing that in his basement. Eh? We did surveillance in her, in her library. Okay, here he goes. Triggered, one, 1,000, two, 1,000, three, 1,000, four, 1,005, 1,006, 1,007, 1,008, 1,009, 1,010, 1,011, 1,012, 1,013, 1,000, boom, bomb goes off. We, we, we watched him in a library, and, uh, you know, they got the uh, covers on the side, and uh, surveillance team sees smoke coming out from the back of the library. So cover guy goes by and looks, and what is he doing? He's soldering the circuit in the public library. So what they had done is they had covered the inside of the boxes in which they thought was ammonium nitrate. They learned from the 2004... A fertilizer bomb plot because the police had come in and switched the materials. So here they thought they ordered three tons of ammonium nitrate, right? 
One does not merely order three tons of moon and I. They come outside, they hear something. Oh, damn it. And that was over for them. And that was over. So that ends the Toronto 18 part. I'm going to switch into my uh, Syria thing. Uh, please raise your hand if I get a little over the time because I do tend to go on a bit. Uh, this is just a map that kind of shows, that does show the, the foreign fighters and the different places that they come from. It's already out of date. I mean, every time you print a map like this, it's out of date. So, I mean, just, it's just a frame of reference. Also, though, for the purposes of context, I mean, I understand there are a lot of foreign fighters and, you know, what, I mean, you saw what just two people in France, in Paris, can do. And I, and I accept that. But think about this. In North America alone, there are two million Muslims. Two million. In North America and Europe, there are millions of Muslims. How many Western foreign fighters are there? 5,000. So keep it in perspective. So now, this is really what it comes down to, the top one. It's not the number of people killed. It's the number of people watching. Because terrorism is theater. They learned this in the 70s when, when they were hijacking airplanes and there were camera crews waiting for them at, on the tarmac. Right? Or like they say at the bottom, we use Twitter and YouTube at the same time we do battle. Ask.fm. So you got people that go on there and say, hey, look, what's the best kind of phone I should bring? Any iPhone uh, users here? Yeah. Don't go, to, don't go for jihad. Okay. Uh, look, if I join ISIS, do I have to wait or will I get weapons right away? Look, weapon will be given free as well as ammo. After training, you will be put on ribalt. Ribalt is sentry duty. And then if there's a battle, you'll be given a chance to go and fight. This is all being done right out in the open, right? Um, getting tazkiyah before coming. Or, you know, what about married brothers? So they get housing, paid extra for every wife. Maybe that's why they marry four wives, I don't know. Uh, when you get married, 700 bucks from ISIS. Look at this. Right? And these are people that want to go. So when you talk about recruiting, how does this all happen? First, people express interest, and this is how they do it. They know they can do this online. You know, now while all this intelligence-specific stuff was happening, I start to see this other theme come out of it. Food pictures. Right? Food pictures. So... Magnus Ranstorp is a very uh, well-known uh, academic in this topic, and he knew I was doing this. So he gives his for your jihadi food collection. So this is posted by a Swedish jihadi who's got Swedish gummy bears. Or kebabs. Yeah, we got that. And, and this was in the beginning when they were, and this is January 2013, okay? This is when they were trying to show that, hey, it's great over here. You're going to get everything you want. Relax. It's not the, you know what I mean, the bad, bad place that everyone is telling you it is. No, no, no. There was a term that came out from this called five-star jihad, right? So they got, yeah, kebabs. Yeah, we got that. We got all this stuff. Look, in the land of Pepsi, Coke is still king, baby, right? <laughs> or how could I not take a picture of that, right? Look at the, look at the mentality, right? I love this. Indo-Pakistani, British national, in Syria, referring to pizza as home food. It just shows you that they are products of our society. Multicultural, identity issues, it's all mixed up. It's all mixed up. Look, just cooked lunch for the brothers. I'm actually starting to enjoy cooking. Now, I can show you profile after profile after profile of, of women and females. Uh, we hear a lot about this, but I, I think it really comes down to this right here. The idea of being a caring wife for a mujahid today and loving mother of the mujahid tomorrow. The idea of populating the new Islamic state to be that, that new generation, that first generation, that select few, right, to do what others won't do or can't do because they're not as Muslim enough as you are. Oh yeah, jihadi eye candy. Look at the second paragraph. As a teenager, I wanted to get my piece of eye candy. Every time I saw these jihadis, they were so hot, right? They're, 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 they're swashbuckling jihadi prints, right? That's what it was about. Think about it. These girls are at home, can't get out, can't mix with other genders without being, like, accused of God knows what, right? Or maybe being killed because of, you know, honor crime, right? So they stay at home. 
So who are they going to talk to? They're going to talk to their jihadi boyfriends online. And when the parents hear, you know, melodious, uh, seemingly Quranic music like coming out of the bedroom, oh, my daughter is so pious. She's listening to the Quran. She's listening to lectures. Right? Look at this. The love of jihad till martyrdom do us part. Right? And guess what? Martyrdom did part them. They were both killed. So the idea of the plight of innocence, I mean, yeah, there's that whole radical Islamic ideology, but there is also the issue of what is happening in Syria. And is it atrocity what is happening in Syria? I mean, the, what, I mean, every human rights organization, they say is the greatest humanitarian disaster in modern time. Okay? Nine million people displaced. Nine million. I mean, what, what, what Bashar al-Assad is doing to people it is, I don't want to get into a commentary, but the idea that a, a dictator who, threw, who drops chlorine bombs on his people is the safe option, what has the world come to? So when they see what's happening, how can you not want to do something? I lived in Syria. I saw those places that they, refer, that they reference all the time. I was there. I can only imagine what those places look like now. And the people that were there, I'm afraid of contacting people that I knew in Syria. Because... God knows maybe the intelligence apparatus would find out, oh, why are you talking to this guy? Oh, that guy, the spy? You're a spy, you're dead. You know, so, so more profiles of people who follow me on Twitter. It's, it's kind of funny because, uh, you know, he says, I'm an extremist. I said, look, white guy, good looking. I mean, and, and because I, I got on Twitter and uh, in the beginning there was a lot of trash talk because, you know, you're a spy, you're an apostate, uh, you're evil. Uh, but when, when, they, when, they, when they realized that I knew what I was talking about, more and more started to follow me on Twitter, and they still do that now. I got Al-Qaeda followers, ISIS followers. It ain't pretty. Uh, but, you know, I, I like to use this guy because I, I've been using this screen grab for a long time as an example. You know, 20-year-old white kid from Finland, uh, Mujahid for life, okay? But I worked on him for a year and a half, micro-engagement, direct messaging, public messaging, and a year and a half later, this guy came around and says, you know what, you're right. These extremists, what they're doing, it's not right. I gave him Islamic references and Islamic proofs. And he finally came around and realized, yeah. And, and I thought in the beginning, maybe this guy thinks, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm feeding information to his intelligence agency. But he actually had a good conversation with me. He told me that this guy's actually done his research. So I started him off with a, with a screw-up story. He is now a success story. Uh, just some more examples of what their, what their profile accounts look like, right? You know, radical Islamist, right? I mean, they, they embrace these terms. So, PSYOPs against ISIS, okay? What's the military doing, right? I mean, different, so I, I give a version of this to the military and I have this slide for them because every institution has its own mandate and what they can do and what they can't do. So here's an example of what the Pentagon is dropping as their leaflets in ISIS-controlled areas, okay, or nearby areas, right? The idea that they're just putting into a meat grinder. But look at their psyops. Look at their recruiting posters. So is it any wonder that screw-ups with criminal backgrounds go and join ISIS? Because it's, it's a way to clean your slate, isn't it? Or they're not listening to you? Well, they're going to listen to you now, aren't they? I mean, certainly they have the attention of the world, don't they? Or those zeros who became heroes overnight because they were part of ISIS, because they were foreign fighters who went from Australia or America or Britain. Now, you're, now you know them, don't you? Right? When deeds speak, words are nothing. Right? Forget about thinking about it. Don't think about it. Just go. Right? And we heard about Call of Duty. Okay, not regretting the chances you make, right? One bullet away from paradise, Jannah. Yeah, this is our Call of Duty and we respawn in Jannah. See that? Or the guy down there, look, he's getting really serious. He's thinking of getting PlayStation 4. You know, and, and it's chuckle-worthy for sure. But Anders Breivik, responsible for the worst terror attack in modern Europe, that's what he practiced on. In fact, Grand Theft Auto, you say? Here it is. The idea of drive over people with your car? Here you go. Shoot people randomly? No problem.
Right? You get the idea. Now here's an example of counter-messaging. There's a lot of talk about this. How are we going to counter the message of ISIS? Who's going to do it? Who's got the money for it? Who's got the time for it? Who's got the expertise to do it? So here's an example of mocking them. Okay, so the Lion King Dawla edition. So basically what they're using is uh, Islamic terminology. So Taghut is who's considered to be the, the uh, uh, non-rightful ruler. So, you know, in, in the Lion King, right, he's, he's depicted as, oh, he's not the real leader. So you can see the legitimate uh, emir is Abu Skar, right? Or, for example, um, you know, uh, let's say the spy, right? The bird is a spy. So what they're doing here is they're, they're making fun of, of ISIS. This is the State Department, United States, and this is their counter video. It's a short clip, two minutes. You know, so when people ask, you know, how come Muslims don't speak out in those lands where ISIS is? Because they'll cut your head off, is why. They'll blow themselves up in mosques, is why. Use of child soldiers, we're seeing more and more of that. Okay, I'm going to skip out. I know, I know you guys are like... All right, so here's what they did. They flipped the script on, on the U.S. State Department. They said, yeah, don't join the U.S. Army. Don't become a terrorist. Think again, turn away. Right? So it, just, it shows you the ongoing back and forth. I mean, this is a battle that's taking place of ideas. Uh, it's online and it's in the real world and it needs to be fought in that way. So you heard about terror, uh, apostates? Well, this is Al-Murtad, the apostate, Mubin Sheikh. And they, what they do is they give warnings. They've given warnings about me because of me interacting with them and arguing with them. So when I see, uh, I don't know, they put my LinkedIn profile there. So every time I see anonymous profile views, uh, maybe, uh, maybe it's one of them. Or here's another example. This was from a Facebook page where they said, look, you know, watch out, block this guy. He put a lot of Muslim brothers in prison and he's working with the kuffar, the non-Muslims. You can find about him on the internet. Just block him. Or in the case of this guy here, for years he's been back and forth with me. How I wish it was apostate caliphate cop. That's my, that's my handle. I actually came out with this handle a few months before ISIS declared its so-called caliphate uh, because I knew they were going to do this. I, I could read the dot, I mean, you know, connect the dots. And so all of a sudden people were like, how did you know? Well, it's because I can connect the dots, right? Um, so, and I just, and I, you know, I say it back to them. I was like, I wouldn't cut your head off. I just rip it right off, right? Or here, for example, uh, when this uh, Israeli Palestinian was killed, you know, he posts it and he says, yeah, you know, I was thinking about you. 
So I try to psych them out a little bit, get into their heads, say that, no, no, it's, you know I'm right, but you post this just to reinforce your beliefs. So of course, some of them get really upset, and this is really recent, so I make it a point to, to tag it chronologically so that July 2014, I guess it's almost gonna be a year now, but uh, I mean, why do you keep promoting Mubin Sheikh? And this is what they don't like. The fact that I am who I am, but they still talk to me, they'll retweet some of my stuff, or they'll at least favorite it or in, and until they dis, uh, figure out who I am, and then they'll be like, oh my God, you know, I gotta repent because I favorited his tweet or something. Um, <laughs> But uh, this will be a last example, and I'll close it off. Uh, but this is an example of white girl, Seattle, Washington. Has fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, right? Um, they were targeting her. They were sending her chocolates. They were chatting with her online. We, I love you. I want to marry you, right? And she's not all there, right? She has elderly grandparents who, I mean, what's the internet, right? Younger siblings, like, you know, 10 years younger, Okay, I mean, one has obvious signs of cognitive impairment, and they were on her. And so I got tagged in a tweet, and somebody said, hey, you should talk to Caliphate Cop. And so I started to talk to her, and I didn't realize that she was like that. So in the, in the, if you see from the top, I came really harsh at her, because some of my tactics, it's like aggressive, passive aggressive, and passive. So I came really hard at her, and I, I saw her starting to push away, so I came back to her, right? I said, oh, you know, they said, you know, they use verses to back it up. So I, so I said, yeah, I used to be an extremist. I know the verses, you know, tell me them so I can debunk them. So then, you know, I gave her free uh, resources online that go and check, you know, these are legit sources of Islam. Don't learn Islam from strangers online. And so, you know, you know she's saying that, look, I, I'm sincere when I say they've always been kind to me. And so I'm telling her, yeah, that it's a cover to lure you in, right? So in the end, I mean, there's a lot of screen grabs that go on and on, but in the end, she, she backed away from them. I mean, this is a better case because there was a reporter that got involved, the FBI got involved, and the FBI are doing their thing on their end. Um, I don't know what the, the reporter was supposed to um, basically expose this guy, but he's a 40-year-old guy in England, married, has a kid. His wife has no idea what he's doing. His wife is a teacher. Right? She's got no idea what he's doing, right? So, uh, oh, this is the last section. Please bear with me two minutes. I mean, so I'm going to give you the Islamic counter message, okay? And what I say down here to this guy, and I was, I mean, he, him and I were back and forth, and my profile pictures change a bit because this is when all, a lot of those guys were, were showing themselves as being big and bad. So I, I imitated that, right? So I would show that that's me and my buddy, you know, skydiving, or, uh, you know, with a gun, if I was doing military training or whatever it was. And so what I say to him here is that, look, now, if there's one thing I can give to you today to go back with, it's this. ISIS is what Muslims call khawarij. That's the, the title in brackets. Second sentence, first word. Khawarij were an ancient sect that emerged after the Prophet, peace be upon him, who declared other Muslims as apostates, who killed them, who misinterpreted the Qur'an, though they, they fasted, they prayed, but they misapplied, they falsified from the Qur'an. They declared even the companions of the Prophet as apostates. They declared all other lands as apostate lands except their lands. This is exactly what ISIS is doing today. And look at what the Prophet says about these people. So this idea that ISIS is Islamic because they use portions of the Qur'an here and there, and this, that, ridiculous. Because the Prophet himself said that's exactly what they're going to do. They're going to take pieces and, and they're going to falsify to the Muslims about what the Qur'an says. So hear what he says. They will leave the religion. They will leave the religion. In fact, when they talk about apostates, this, and this, I should say, this is a Bukhari, which is Sunni Islamic Hadith literature. It's the most authentic Sunni Hadith literature that I'm going to show you. Okay? So here, Bukhari, who was a collector of the hadith, he says that these people are the apostates. Because the, the term here is, uh, um, the, you know, they will say the best words, but their faith will not go beyond their throats. This is a theme that appears in uh, other hadith that talk about the khawarij. So like the first one, you know, the, they will recite the Quran and will not go past their throats. If you look at the second one, the, during the last days, there will appear some young foolish people 
who will recite the best of words. And if you look at the overwhelming majority of ISIS uh, volunteers, all foolish young people. Here, what the Prophet said, blessedness is for those who kill them and those who are killed by them. They are the most evil of creation. Whoever encounters them, let him kill them, since there is a reward for him on the Day of Judgment. They are the dogs of hellfire. Okay? Or, look, they were Muslims, but they became disbelievers. And in Islam, there's this whole difference of opinion on whether they are Muslims or they're not Muslims. Uh, this is what I use. I say, well, you can differ on your opinions all you want. Here is what the Prophet said. And this is what is called Hassan, Hadith Hassan, which is called good. It's just under the, most, the highest level, which is authentic. Okay, and authentic and good you are allowed to use for your belief system. I mean, look at what Ibn Kathir, this is, I mean, hundreds of years ago, he says, if they became powerful, they would corrupt the entire earth from Iraq to Syria. Wow. They wouldn't spare even children because in their view, people have become corrupt and only execution can rectify them. Remember what that guy said at the end? We will take you from kufr to Islam, from shirk to tawheed. This is what he's talking about. And how are they doing that? They're killing everyone in, in, in their path doing that. I'm going to tell you, these are my personal religious views. Some of you may be religious, some of you may not be. Uh, Muslims and Christians believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. And we believe in the second coming of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. But we know that before Jesus Christ comes, peace be upon him, the Antichrist will, 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 will precede him. So here, the Prophet said, they will come from my nation. They will appear to be Muslims. But from their last remnants, the Antichrist will emerge. And here's the kicker. And, and I give this to them. I say to them, you people are not Muslims. You're not jihadis. You're not mujahideen. You are the people of the Antichrist. Really. And this is the kicker one. And I love this one. Because in the most authentic tradition, the Prophet said, the Antichrist will emerge on the road between Iraq and Syria. And there was no road between Iraq and Syria until ISIS literally bulldozed one. I'm going to leave you with this last video because it's a lot of bad stuff. But this is a, an, a descendant of the Prophet, peace be upon him, living descendant, millions of followers all around the world, real Islam. Two minutes, and then we're done. Watch his eyes, he leaves.
All right. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. If you have any questions, we have a microphone for Anne and Mubin. At the front, just raise your hand. Oh. No, I did it. Okay. So if you have a question, raise your hand. We'll come to you with a mic. Come on. I must have questions. Oh, I got to run around here. Sorry. First, thank you both for your time this evening. Uh, question, Mubin, for you. Um, you mentioned how you had a, a mentor that kind of walked you through scripture to to write uh, what your understanding was how in that process with him did he or would you explain the laws of abrogation and how it becomes more violent throughout the quran as well as the prophet's life and representation in the second um for islamists that can't compete the rule that they are to deceit uh the west until they are uh, on a similar playing field where they can be competitive. Do you understand the second part yep. there? Okay, thank you. Tuqiya and Kitman. Shukran. So two points. Um, so the, the, uh, it gets complicated. Uh, what he was referring to is a nasikh wa mansukh, the abrogated verses. So there are some verses which may have been revealed early on. I mean, the Quranic revelation is it took place over a period of 23 years, uh, 10 years which were in Mecca, 12 years which were in Medina, and then there was a final couple of years in Mecca. Uh, and many things were happening in that time. Uh, in the first 10 years of Mecca, there was, oh, there was no laws. Uh, there wasn't prayer, there wasn't anything, fasting. There was just belief in one God. And in the latter years, and what happened was as the Muslims were persecuted, they fled to Medina. Uh, this marked the Hijrah, the period of emigration. And after the Muslims left Medina, the Meccans, the, the pagan Meccans, didn't like the fact that they had now set up shop uh, in a bigger city and they had the, the uh, support of a lot of the uh, powerful people in Medina. So a series of battles ensued. The pagans brought their uh, forces over to Mecca uh, to annihilate the Muslims. And this is where you start to see the verses come out about jihad. So the first verse of jihad was, permission is given to fight. And so that tells you right away that this is something you're not allowed to do. I mean, there must be a reason for you to do this. So the permission that was given to fight was for those who evict you from your homes and persecute you because you're a Muslim. Okay? So in the discussion on what is abrogated and what isn't abrogated, there's a huge scholarly tradition on which verses were abrogated, which ones were not. And there, there seem to be people in two camps. Some who say that, well, we follow the Meccan verses. I mean, the ones that were very nice, and it's got no violence in it, it's got no fighting in it. And then others who say, no, screw the you know, uh, kumbaya stuff. We're going to stick to the violent stuff. And, 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 I, and the way that the scholar explained it to me was that this is the context in which these things were happening. So when you read a verse, you have to look at other verses like it. Or when you read a particular word in the Quran, you have to see what other words say in the Qur'an. So for example, jihad. The word jihad is, actually doesn't mean to fight. It means to strive. Qital, mean to kill or to fight. That's the word, that's what we talk about when we talk about combative jihad. So the scholar showed me that you have to look at the entire context. You have to look at not just the, the, the uh, what's called the asbab al nuzul the conditions in which that verse was revealed, but you have to look at the entire time spectrum in which this verse is coming down. What verses came before it and what verses came after it. Um, so this is, how, this is how he explained it to me. Um, and uh, the second part, this is, a, uh, I mean, this is something that's been talked about a lot on Fox News, um, <laughs> about uh, Tukia, what's called Tukia. And, uh, and it comes from the idea that if you're, and this is the, uh, the suburb of this, uh, of this concept, it's basically denial of your faith. So the, the, uh, uh, the ruling is that when you are under threat of severe bodily harm or death, you can deny the fact that you're a Muslim. In fact, this is what happened to Christians and Jews and Muslims, Muslims who did it to Christians, Christians who did it to Muslims, Christians who did it to Jews. The Jews really didn't do it to anyone, did they? Uh, but this is what happened when they were forcing people. They said, yeah, okay, I don't believe, right? Um, so this is the, the origin of that term, Tukya. 
to deny your faith and to, to deceive somebody that you're not a Muslim. Now, now it's been operationalized. So you have people who, let's say the 9-11 hijackers. And now what they did was, what in a, in a, you know, in a spy term or counterterrorism context, we call denial and deception, right? They went to strip joints, they went to alcohol, they went to bars, they drank. It was to lay low. It was infiltration. It was deny. Don't let them, don't let on that you're a Muslim, right? So, so there are two, the, I mean, the original concept of it was if you're in fear of your life, you know, you could deny your religion. The operational side is what a lot of, uh, I mean, this is what jihadists do. Um, you know, they'll, they'll take their beard off. Uh, they'll make like they're, they're not Muslim. But, uh, I mean, you know, what I see now in, in, in like some of the, um, you know, in some media outlets, um, you know, it's the idea that all Muslims, they lie. They, you just can't trust them. You know what I mean? So one of the things that I, I said back to them, because I was actually on Fox News uh, yesterday with, with Greta. She was very nice. Um, and, you know, somebody came on the Twitter feed and he's like, no, he's lying to you, Greta. He's doing takia. It's all a lie. So I said, okay, I mean, was I doing takia when I lied to my Muslim brothers that I was one of them, but I was really trying to stop them? Yes, it is. I'm operationalizing it, but I'm using it on them. So I would say that we have to see what context in which it's used. I mean, and, and I don't want to take away from that because this is kind of the business I was in. I mean, there are people who do that. They will, they will completely lay low. They won't let on what they're about. It'll be completely, you know, whatever. But their agenda is something else. So. More questions? Beer. Hello, thank you very much for your talk. This is very interesting. Um, for the Toronto 18 and other, I guess, terrorists who are in prison, what kind of, um, what things are in practice now to prevent, you know, or I guess we were saying like de-radicalizing, you know, to, to come out of prison, is there something in place now that people would come out of prison and not just go back to what they were doing before? Every country and uh, in the States, uh a lot of the states and some of the cities are trying things. And what most of the prison de-radicalization programs started with was what Singapore and Saudi were doing, and, that, and Yemen. And that was uh, sending a friendly imam in to, who really knew his Quran. And he would go in and create some kind of rapport. And then he would say, you know, brother, you just don't have um, Islam correct. And, you know, what about this one? What about that one? So kind of the things that Mubian was just saying and, you know, pointing out different verses. And when I was asked to uh, design the detainee rehabilitation, psychological and uh, Islamic challenge portions of the program, I, I, it was the first one to add the psychological piece. Because what I told uh, General Garner at that time is, these people were highly traumatized. I mean, you know, they didn't just join, their country was invaded and they came from trauma before that. And every single person that I talked to among the detainees, the way they had been arrested, they'd either been arrested by the Iraqis and turned over to us. And if they were arrested by the Iraqis, they were tortured. If they were arrested by us, I'm sorry to say, but they were really beaten badly. And this was without exception among the interviews I made with detainees. So, you know, the, <laughs> they'd gone through something that wasn't so good, and then there was all kinds of other stuff. So our idea was to do the Islamic challenge at the same time as we were also trying to find out how did this ideology find a hook inside of them? You know, wh what's resonating for them? And start to take their religion and take psychology to change that passion. Because terrorists, a lot of times, are passionate people. They want change. Like Mubin was saying, they want change. And they might jump from A to Z quickly because they're just getting frustrated. And they, they see injustice, and they want it to change. And they believe that violence is the answer. So we wanted to redirect that passion. But And actually, we told the general, we thought the hardest thing to do was to uh, deal with a kid that was getting $300 for laying a roadside bomb. You know, what do you do with him? How do you de -radi He's not radicalized. He's just out for the money. He needs it. And that's a lot harder. That's a different, a totally different uh, answer. 
But each country is doing different things. Denmark's being very friendly to their foreign fighters that are coming home, putting them into a program, um, trying to reintegrate them into the community. We've seen some of this in Minnesota, and we've seen one failure now. And you know, the thing that's really hard is when people lie to you. And you know, of course they're going to. If they can get out of prison or get a go-free card, um, they're going to lie. And you have to try to figure out you know, are we seeing real change, or are we just seeing somebody that's playing the game and they're going to get out? And uh, will we be able to um, keep them, keep tabs on them? And you know, it depends what kind of society you live in. In Iraq, I said, you know, you're letting them out into a battle zone, and I guarantee you. I, well, I told General Stone, it's like we do alcoholism rehab, and we know that one third of the people get better and stop drinking, um, but one third of them. The minute they get out, they'll start drinking. One third of them, I meant of all the people that get better, these are the thirds, sorry. One third will um, drink right away. One third will wait until something upsets them and they'll fall off the wagon. And then one third will be okay. But um, you know, what do we expect if we're letting people out into an active conflict zone? And we're not Saudi Arabia where we can give them a wife and a car. The people would be lining up as radicals, right? Yeah. <laughs> so Mubin maybe has some more to say on that too. Yeah, it's really, uh, I have a much more cynical view. Uh, it's, uh, we're not doing anything close to what we should be doing. Uh, Canada, there's a whole talk, there's a lot of talk about what's happening, but zero funding for community organizations. Um, Britain is still struggling with it. Uh, you know, at the same time, you have uh, community activist groups, I'm sorry to say, but they're just naysayer groups that they will just criticize anything and everything that the government does. Uh, they poison the minds of the community, so that creates a second barrier. But, you know, okay, I'll be a little optimistic. I mean, th things are moving. They are moving because I've personally had conversations uh, with U.S. government people uh, who are, you know, who are looking to get something going. But it's, I personally believe <clears throat> it can't be from the government. It has to be from the community itself because those people are going to go back into that same community. And if it's got the stamp of the government on it, it, it just, it, it'll, it'll lose credibility. And if things do go sideways, uh, you know, you're not going to blame the government, you're going to blame the community, right? And just the last point, yeah, uh, we, we, we expect that, what, there's going to be a 100% success rate? What's an acceptable rate for a terrorist to go back to terrorism, right? So hard questions. And I guess I would just add to that, too, that I'd much rather see a lot more prevention work being done. We could do so much on prevention. And you know, you saw a few of the examples. They're very, very recent. I've been asking for eight or 10 years, why don't we have emotionally charged, emotionally packed, good arguments with good video out on the internet? And they, they should be. And now, finally, we're starting to see them. And this is all about funding, because I've been begging for funds for that for years. And, and that's only one idea. I mean, we should be going into schools and teaching these ideologies. Because it's not only Islam that uh, uh, you know, people have hijacked for terrorism. We've seen abortion clinic uh, uh, terrorists use Christian scriptures. We've seen uh, Barack Goldstein go in and uh, mow down uh, people that were praying in a mosque using his religion. So you know, we could easily develop an eighth grade civics course on uh, violent ideologies and go through them and convince eighth graders, you know, there's, there's no cause, no cause ever that justifies intentionally targeting uh, civilians. And you know, that would get into a lot of heads, wouldn't stop everybody, but it would make them at least think before they're you know, logging onto the internet and going, oh cool, this looks cool, and you know, just going along with it. I understand in the uh, Muslim countries why a Muslim might not want to speak out against ISIS. That's, that. that's pretty clear. But how about here in the United States? We don't get a lot of Muslim uh, communities speaking out against a lot of the atrocities, although we've had a few more recently with the beheadings. But widespread Muslims aren't just standing up and speaking out against these. Yeah, and, and I'll tell you why because they don't get the media coverage when they do. I guarantee you, uh, you can, it's very easy to go online to see every single Islamic organization you can imagine. Believe me, they don't want anything to do with a group like ISIS. I mean, what ISIS is doing, I mean, it, it's just, it's beyond description, really. 
And uh, I have seen how you have community organizations trying. I mean, every time there's an attack, they have to issue a statement because, you know, we're all responsible, right? You know, like in Texas, for example, there are uh, 140,000 Muslims in Texas. Not a single one showed up to protest uh, the cartoon, the, whatever they called it, the art contest. But two guys go off and do their thing, and every Muslim in Texas now has got to watch their back, basically. So on one hand, you have, you have them speaking out, but I see it. I see the statements that come out. Nobody covers it. In the Canadian example, uh, in Calgary, because there were a number of, like a group of jihadis who went from Calgary, so of course it's like, oh, Calgary's got a jihadi problem, right? It doesn't. It's just five buddies who are hanging out. One guy goes, he brings the second one over, three more go, and so of course it turned into a, now the guy, the Muslim scholar, the guy literally walked across Canada for interfaith, kumbaya, fluffy, fluffy stuff, right? Like, and Canada's huge. <laughs> And he walked across the country. He's, he's an elderly guy, right? Pakistan, he's got thick accent. He arranged two anti-ISIS rallies. The local paper covered it, that's it. So I, but my frustration goes both ways to the, the larger population in the US that doesn't see this. And I don't blame, believe me when I tell, I'm gonna say this openly, I don't, not only do I not blame Americans for wondering why Muslims aren't speaking up, white, non-Muslim, whatever, or black, or brown, whatever. Uh, but I don't even blame you for hating what is depicted as Islam. Because any person that has a brain in their skull, if they were to look and see what this group is doing and you were to say that this is X and X religion, I would think that religion is from Satan himself. So I don't blame the public for thinking that. And it's, it's sad that the, the media doesn't carry more messages. It really is because it's, it's doing all of us a, a disservice. Okay, I think oh, I have one here and then the last question. Oh. This is actually um, shikram, by the way. Um, this is more of a, a comment to people. If you have not read the article in The Atlantic, uh, What Woods. ISIS Really Wants by Graham Wood, I think maybe March. Some, well, I should say that, uh, that there was a response to that, which I was quoted in because uh, uh -huh. yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I don't agree with the premise of it. I mean, he was saying that because they use Islam, they're Islamic. That's like saying, you know, the KKK uses Christianity, so they're Christian. No, actually, no, yeah, I, I'm you're, sorry. You're a it was, point. Yeah. yeah, it was more that if you're Muslim and you don't swear allegiance to the caliphate, then you're considered an apostate. Yeah, you're an apostate. Um, uh, but... It, it was extremely move. informative, um, it's and a good if you have another opinion, I'd love to hear it. No, it's not, I and mean, it is, it, I liked it. I mean, uh, I kind of, I've had a back and forth with Graham Wood. Um, but this is the whole idea, that they are Khawarij. The Khawarij did exactly this. They declared all other lands as apostate lands, and if you didn't sign up, you are an apostate too, and they would kill you. And this is, this is their mentality. It is a... I, I hate to say it, I mean, maybe George Bush was right. Oh, that was hard to say. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. No, no, but the, the, the term Islamofascist, okay? This group, I, I, that's exactly what they are. It, they are not only Islamofascist, they are a cult. They are really a death cult. I mean, the way that they suck people in, the way that they keep you in, and if you dare leave, bullet to the back of the head, yep. But they're, they're clever on playing on anxieties, too, because if they convince you this, this is the end times, this is the real caliphate, it's in the right place, right time, and uh, if you're not with us, you're apostate, you're going to burn in hell. And the Islamic hell is not a nice place to end up in. So they play on anxieties, too. There was another question. You've got one. Thank you. So it's in response to your earlier comment that media doesn't, of course, media is hungry for sensational news and, and Muslims uh, marching against ISIS is not sensational by all means. But what about social media? Is it gaining momentum? Do you think this is going to make a difference going forward as opposed to old ways media? Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's one of uh, a number of tactics that can be used. So, you know, they had some campaigns, you know, not in my name. 
uh, they, some people tried my hashtag my jihad. They tried to make, you know, because again, look, for all intents and purposes, when jihad, the term jihad is used, it means fighting. Okay, it might not have originally literally meant that, but the, the use of that concept means fighting for all intents and purposes. Yes, the, the actual meaning means struggle and your daily struggle. And so, you know, they started this hashtag, my jihad, and it was like, my jihad is to like, you know, get my kids out the door before I got to get to work for nine o'clock, right? Like that sort of stuff. But then these things, they start to get hijacked by trolls, right? So even when you try to do it, the, the, you know, the, the malevolent people come on and, and they trash all over it. So it goes both ways. Um, I think it, the social media thing is effective to a point, uh, only for those people who are engaging in, in that sort of environment or uh, operating in that environment. That's just only one part of it. There has to be uh, public education uh, along those lines. There has to be a military component, big time. Uh, you know, all, all this, like, there's a whole conversation on whether or not, I mean, we disagree on this one, but, you know, sting operations, right? I mean, they're picking up, now I, I don't agree with sting operations involving teenagers, uh, largely because the teenage brain, this is a physical fact, the teenage brain is physically not developed to a point where it can actually appraise and, and look at the consequences of their, so I mean, I don't, I don't agree with that, but in general, the law enforcement perspective is a tactic to use, but uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, social media, it's, it's just kind of starting off. There really isn't that much going on. Um, but I think we will see it increase considerably because, I mean, now there's talk of funding and you have large organizations that are putting money and, and expertise. So we'll see. We'll see. What comes out of that. I just want to clarify that. I don't have any trouble with sting operations. I have trouble with a kid that's bragging on the internet and somebody older from the FBI or so on showing up and pretending to be Al-Qaeda because we know the four things that make a terrorist. One of them is social support. So if you come and you take the person farther along their tra trajectory by pretending to be one of them and saying, I can equip you, mm, that just really disturbs me. So that, that's the thing that I've got problems with. But you know, if you're watching somebody and he looks like he's going to act and you go undercover and catch him, I mean, I told you, I think Mubin's a hero. And those kind of things, I think, are great. But when we take somebody farther along the trajectory, it worries me. And? Well, we had somebody, we had somebody, yeah, I mean, there's a Mother Jones article that's uh, um, written quite a few, written up a, quite a few of them, and I don't know if it's giving all the details of the cases, but, you know, if a kid's bragging, bragging, bragging on the internet and saying, I'm willing to do these things, and an agent shows up and says, well, how willing are you, and he keeps bragging, 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 would he have just always been a braggart if he had never met the agent? But if the agent says, well, are you willing to go survey something? I'll give you the camera. And you go survey something, and are you willing to go suicide bomb yourself? I'll give you the bomb. Ugh. You know, it's just, I think that we, we owe a duty, especially to youth, to not carry them along the terrorist trajectory. But if somebody's on it and serious, yeah, we've got to catch those people. And it gets nuanced, you know, at certain edges, but, you know, there's some that I just think we need to really think carefully. Maybe in, the, in these examples, if they're teenagers, we shouldn't. Maybe we can say that the authorities can deploy other tactics, maybe diversion tactics. Um, but then at some point where we decide they're adults, uh, I consider that fair game, man. I mean, and we do, we do have now. Yeah. The, um, uh, um, Mubin is a PhD student with John Cole, and he's got something called the IVP. We developed something very similar in Iraq to try to rate our detainees on how extremist and how committed to violence they were. And Mubin went through some of those factors from the IVP, if you remember from his presentation. And one of the other PhD students was observing social media profiles and rating the people. And he came up with 300 of concern. And he asked his Human Subjects Review Board, his name's Jeff Wires, um, you know, should we alert police? Because he's police himself. And he's like, these look serious. So they did. And then the police went and investigated and found explosives and guns and so on and made arrests. I'm all for that. 
you know, if there's a braggart, um, and a lot of people now, because this is about identity with the homegrowns, they just can't keep their mouth shut. They tweet about it, they go on Facebook, and they're like, I'm ISIS, because they want to be, in their view, heroic, adventurous, and, you know, this so-called positive identity that they think it is. And if, if there's both things going on, yeah, of course, you know, then, you know, sting operation, I'm all for. Exactly what Mubin did. I mean, he was asked to go and um, pretend to go on this training camp with them, and they asked him to buy a gun, but they asked. And he did buy the gun, and as soon as uh, his handlers found out, he had to get rid of the gun. But, um, you know, it, it wasn't Mubin's idea, hey, how about I get a gun and then we'll play jihad? You know, it was them. So that, that would be the difference for me. The, the idea, the instigation has to come from the person themselves. Thank you both so much. Anne and Mubin will both be here. You can ask a question personally at the back. They will sign Mubin's memoir, co-authored by Anne. Thank you both so very much. And thanks for having us.